proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail the pioneers of air safety. Entitled A Medal for Joe, a story of the exciting early days of flying and of the men who risked their lives for safety. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first, America looks up to her men in the sky. Yes, our country looks up to the young men thundering their way to new glory in the skies. Theirs is a task held in high esteem by the entire nation. You are needed to swell their ranks and can do so by enrolling now in the Aviation Cadet Training Program of the United States Air Force. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and ask about the Aviation Cadet Training Program. Do it today. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, A Medal for Joe. Oh, another cup of coffee and I'd explode. Gee, that was a wonderful dinner, Julie. You're even a better cook than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a long time since I had a chance to show off in the kitchen for you. Yeah, it has been a long time, hasn't it? And yet it seems like just a couple of hours ago since we were all stationed in Texas and I was barging in on you and Bob. Now, I must have eaten every dinner at your house two years ago. Mm, two years ago. Awful lot has happened since then. Mm, it sure has. Bob and I were on our feet then instead of in the air. Remember how we both signed up for the air service on the same day? Remember? I'll never forget it. The date was August 27th, 1919. Our anniversary. I was afraid then, Ed. Oh, now, what's there to be afraid of? Most accidents happen in the home. People slip in the bathtub or fall down the I cellar know steps. I it, but sometimes I can't help but be a little worried. Haven't you heard anything from the field? No. I called about five just before he got here. Said the flight was delayed. Ran into some bad weather over the mountains or something. Well, I don't think there's anything to worry about. If something was wrong, you'd be getting a call from the field. Those boys are pretty good about keeping everybody up to date. Yeah, I know it is. Now, let's just forget about any silly worries. Let's just think about how surprised Bob will be when he gets home and finds that Ed Hoff... Oh, Major Hoffman, that <laughs> is, is right here in his own quarters at McCook Field. You know, by the way, I don't think it's exactly right for me to just move in like this. Oh, nonsense. We've got plenty of room. And the kids love having you, too. When some good bachelor quarters come up, you can move out, providing it isn't too far away for you to come and have dinner with us every night. Well, with this dinner as an inducement, I think I'd be able to make it a couple of hundred miles for the same thing. <laughs> All right, here. Let me help you with the dishes while we're waiting for uh, No, Bob. no, I certainly won't let you help. You just go into the living room and read the paper. It won't take me a minute. Bob will be here before I finish. Might as well have blindfolds on as try to see through this fog. You make out anything, Chuck? Pure soup, Bob. Pure soup. Hey, can you take it down, Eddie? I think we must be way beyond those mountain ranges by now. Yeah, if our calculations are right, we're not far from home. It's times like this that I wish I were patrolling the Mexican border again on foot. Yeah, you'll sing a different tune when you walk into your front hall and give Julie a big kiss. I suppose you're right. Let's go down a little, see what we can see. Hey, that's far enough, Bob. Look, there's the field. They got the flares off for us. Hey, Bob. 
Ah, that's far enough. Pull her up. She's stuck, Chuck. I can't pull her up. What's the matter, Julie? Stumble over something? No. No, the glass just fell out of my hand. Ed, something's wrong. I don't know what it is, but something's happened to Bob. Yeah, now, old man. Let's sit here in the sun and tell lies to each other, huh? Feel like a dope having to be waited on like this. Wait till I get out of this cast and I'll throw you over my left shoulder with one hand just to get even with you for having to carry me out here like a baby every afternoon. I sold lemonade coming up. Uh, oh, it's wonderful having you home all the time, darling. Uh, now, there's true love for you. She works like a dog. Both of you do, carting me around, waiting on me hand and foot, and you say it's wonderful having me on the ground. Well, it is now, and don't laugh at me. I wish you could stay on the ground always, Bob. Now, look, Julie, if they told me I couldn't fly, I'd... Well, I don't know what I'd do. So let's just make up our minds to that. As soon as I'm out of this plaster cast, I'm going to be at the ready room waiting for my orders. Oh, I knew that. I guess I knew it all the time. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking in the past five weeks. Since that night we were sitting here waiting for you to come in, Bob. Oh, don't tell me you're on Julie's side. Look, Ed, you were the one who got the idea of transferring to the air service of this U.S. Army. Not that I was more than five seconds behind you, but... Remember all the arguments you had stored away to answer, Julie? Oh, sure, sure, I know. Don't think I transferred any other branch. No, the thinking I was doing was a little different. Well, what, Ed? If it's anything to keep you out of the air, you two lunatics, I'm all for it. No, no, that's not it, Julie. We'll fly. Gosh, we were born to fly. It's just that not enough work is being done on making flying safe. Oh, you're crazy, Ed. They're doing everything they can. What happened that night couldn't have been avoided. It wasn't anybody's fault. But you could have done something, Bob. You and Chuck both. Done something? What? We did everything that was humanly possible. You can't blame that wreck on me or Chuck or anybody else. Well, well, wait a minute. Calm down, fella. I'm not blaming anybody, but look at it this way. You weren't chained in your pilot seat, were you? No, of course not. What are you getting at? And Chuck could have moved around, too, couldn't he? Sure, but I don't see You what... both could have climbed out of the cockpit, couldn't you? Sure, and then we could have soared right down to Earth and let the plane crash without us. Now, Bob, I'm serious. After your accident, while Julie and I were here alone and when... Well, all right, let's be honest. When they thought you were going to die. I stayed up alone, night after night, thinking about something I saw once that might have prevented all this. Nothing could have prevented it. Chuck and I did everything Honey, we... be quiet. Now, let Ed explain. Once I was at a county fair and a guy went up in a balloon. I suppose he was crazy to do it, but he jumped out in a parachute. He could have killed himself, but he didn't. A parachute? What's that? Well, they've been doing a lot more experimenting on them in Europe than they have here. It's sort of like an umbrella, a silk umbrella. The wind slows it down enough so that the guy strapped underneath it just floats down to earth. Sounds like a dream. Oh, sure, it's a dream. The Wright brothers had a dream just eight miles from this field. And we're flying in the product of that dream every day. Well, why hasn't more been done about it, Ed? Oh, I don't know. Lots of reasons. There isn't a lot of money around to spend on aviation yet. And what there is is being spent to make better planes, to make those planes safer. Besides that, there aren't enough people that are convinced it could ever work. Are you convinced, Ed? Yes, I am. Yes, I'm completely convinced. There's an awful lot of work and experimenting to be done. And maybe somebody will get killed trying the things out. But parachutes will work if we work on them hard enough. Well, I don't think I get it entirely. I wasn't at that county fair. Well, it's not hard to explain. It's... Look, you see that milkweed pod there in the garden? That white, fluffy thing that's floating down to earth? Well, sure. We've got dozens of them out here all during the summer. All right. Now, that is the perfect parachute. See how it opens out and just like a silk umbrella, it floats the pod down to the plants? You think that man could build something like that? For, for men to uh, uh, parachute to earth? Yes, I do. If you got the right cloth and the right pulleys and the right, well, the right everything. You see, that's where the trial and error experimenting comes in. But it could be done. It could work. It could have worked that night for you and Chuck. You're a dreamer, Ed, like I said. Oh, yeah. And I think I'll be called worse than that before I'm through. <laughs> Hey, 
And uh, this is the paint section, Major. Mm -hmm. Here's where we've been doing some research on paint that won't rust or chip off. Ah, uh, yes, I see, Corporal. Looks like it's in fairly good shape. Uh, we've been making some headway, sir. And uh, that room in there, what's that? Oh, that's just sort of a supply and storage room. I'm afraid it's, uh, it's not as neat as we'd like it, sir. Well, if you'd known that the new material chief would be such an eager beaver, you probably would have had everything shining, huh? Uh, well, sir, we are pretty short-handed, but we can get it in shape right away. Well, let's go in and take a look anyway. You sure got a lot of junk in here. Most of it is just that, I guess, Major, but I don't like to throw anything out until they tell me to. Thought you might want to see it all, and then we can throw out whatever you say. Mm-hmm. And what's over here in this box? Boy, it's dusty enough. Oh, those. Those are a couple of, what do you call them? Uh, parachutes. Somebody, I can't remember his name, some fellow who was attached to this section a couple of years ago, he was always trying them out. Wait, a parachute? You mean there's been some experimenting on them here at McCookfield? Nothing much from what I hear. I wasn't around then, but uh, this fellow I was telling you about was hipped on the subject. Kept weighting them down and dropping them out of planes. He never got anywhere with him, though. Everybody said he wouldn't, but he kept trying until he was transferred somewhere else. So they've just stayed here gathering dust. Uh, should I throw them out, Major? No, siree. Dust them off. I'll want to inspect them thoroughly this afternoon. And, Corporal, get out anything else that that fellow used in his experiments. I want everything he used out and ready for me to look at right after chow. Yes, sir. <laughs> gentlemen. Anything else? How about you, Hoffman? You getting around all right? Finding out about your new section? Ah, uh, yes, Colonel. It all looks to be in good order. Uh, there's just one thing, sir. Well, go ahead. Staff meeting's the time to bring up any problems you got. That's what we have these sessions for. Well, I have a list of requisitions here, Colonel. Well, you can just put those through channels, can't you? Normal requisitions can just be ordered in the usual fashion. That's all you've got, and we might as well break this up. No, oh, wait, Colonel, this is a little different. This is something I think I'll need staff approval on. You see, it's a list of requisitions for a new section. A new section? Well, that's different. Here, let me see that. One sewing machine, 12 bolts of silk. Hey, what is this? Are you planning on opening a dressmaking shop for the wives of the post? <laughs> well, no, sir, it's... Well, I was hoping to get staff approval to start some experimenting on parachutes. Parachutes? Now, look, Hoffman, let's get this straight. You're in charge of materials. Your job's to work on paint and metals and fabrics, anything else that'll improve our air service. We don't want any crazy experimenting on silk umbrellas going on around here. We haven't got the money or the personnel or the time. I'm not going to risk the lives of any of my men. Colonel, they're risking their lives now every time they go up without any protection. I know that just as well as you do. But my job is to improve what we've got, to eliminate the hazards in the equipment that exists. Your job is to put your section to work on the approved research. Now, let's not consider any harebrained schemes. Well, Colonel, if I work on them in my spare time, would that be all right? Well, sure. There's nothing I can say about how you spend your time off. Any daffy idea you want to carry out on your time off is your business. But my business right now is to throw this requisition in the wastebasket. Dismissed. <laughs> You see, Colonel, I honestly think it will work. Now, not right away. I know it's going to take a long time, probably, but look at it this way. If we don't try, we'll never know if it'll work or not. Can't we just try? Hoffman, you've dogged my footsteps for four months now. Every time I look up, there you are with a requisition in your hand. I'm getting so I, I look under my bed at night to see if you're there. Well, I'm sorry, Colonel. I know I've been a nuisance, but if you just put through this requisition, I promise you won't see hide nor hair of me for months. Just let me try and see if I can make a parachute work. You know, I'm not just starting from scratch. A lot of guys in Europe and here in the States have been working. I've got something to go on. All right, all right, you've worn me down. Get a bowl of silk and fool around with it if you must. Now get out of my sight. Oh, and, uh, and Hoffman. Yes, sir? Good luck. You are listening to the proudly we hail production of A Medal for Joe. We'll return to our story in just a moment. Young men of America, your country is building a mighty air force to maintain the security of our nation. This means that there is a job for you. 
The chance to do an important job with one of the finest organizations of its kind in the world today, the United States Air Force. If you're between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified, the Air Force needs you as part of the Aviation Cadet Training Program. For complete details, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of A Medal for Joe. Here, Corporal, give me a hand with one of these crates, huh? Sure thing, Major. Gosh, these things are heavy. What's in them, sir? Sewing machines. Here, let's put this one over in the middle of the room so we can open it up easily. Right. Sewing machines? And you really got the stuff you asked the Colonel for? You're really going to make some of those parachutes? Mm Mm-hmm, that's right. And go ahead and laugh if you want to. No, sir, I don't think I will. You don't think you'll what? Laugh. What do you mean, I've convinced you after all these months? Well, not really convinced me, but... Well, uh, I'll put it this way. If I were up in a plane instead of here on the ground, I'd like everything I could get my hands on to make sure I'd get back on the ground. Who knows? This thing, this idea of yours might work. I say it's worth trying. Well, what do you know, Corporal? I've got my first convert. Yes, come in. Yes, you gentlemen wanted to see me? Uh, you're Major Hoffman? That's right. I'm Guy Ball. My name's Floyd Smith. We're here. Oh, you don't have to tell me who you guys are. I've seen you make parachute jumps over at right field. Glad (laughs) to meet you both. Well, same here, Major. Go on, go on. Sit down, both of you. Thank you. Well, what brings you men over here? Well, we heard you wanted to hire some men to help out on your experiments with parachutes. I sure do. But you're the first ones to come in here since I placed ads all over the country weeks ago. You mean you really want jobs? Yeah, we sure do. We've been both risking our necks jumping out of planes at fairs all over the barnstorming country. We, uh, we heard you're trying to perfect parachutes. And if there's one thing Floyd and I'd like, it's a perfect parachute. Well, I've never been so glad to see two people in my life. You two guys probably know more about parachuting than anybody in the country. Look, I'm afraid we can't offer you the kind of money you get for trying to break your necks at fairs. Look, Major, Major, it's it's like Guy says. We'd like to get some good parachutes, that's all. That's why we're here. Yeah. Both of us, uh, not to mention our wives, we're a little sick of believing every jump is going to be our last. So uh, we'd like to work with you. But you're hired. When do you want us to go to work? Right now, listen, you can tell me more this afternoon than I could learn in three years of using weights. What do you want to know? I'll just start from the beginning. What kind of chutes did you use? What were the pulleys like? What about the winds? Just tell me everything you know. And when you finish, we'll figure out what we should do to get you to that perfect parachute. Well, there. There he is. A hundred and seventy pounds and the best-looking guy I've ever seen. (laughs) Good morning, Hoffman, Smith. Morning, Colonel. Oh, hello, Colonel. Well, what's this? Pretty large for a puppet. Colonel, I'd like you to meet Joe. Dummy Joe. Well, what's his assignment around here? He's going to make all our experimental jumps, Colonel. You see, we found out that 50-pound weights weren't working right. We discovered that if we wanted to make a good parachute for a man... We'd have to have the next best thing to a real man. That's right. So we built Dummy Joe here. You see, Colonel, his arms and legs are weighted to put the stress on the cords the way a man would do it. Well, anyway, almost the way a man would do it. And we've even got a time fuse in his right hand so Joe can pull the ripcord for himself. Pretty ingenious. Looks like you're making progress here, Hoffman. Well, sir, we've been getting along. Well, how about materials? Uh, You got what you need here? Seems to me I've been signing enough requisitions. I think we've got enough for Joe's first trial anyway, sir. We finally got just the right kind of silk. Had to send all the way to Japan for it, but it should be just right. You see, the wind goes through it. It's porous enough for that. But enough wind should stay in it to billow a man. Joe, that is. Down to earth, just as nice as you please. Well, it sounds as if you're getting along pretty well. Frankly, you're doing better than I thought you would. I'll have to hand it to you, Hoffman. You know how to stick to a job. Well, thanks, Colonel. It's all up to dummy Joe now. 
Well, he's not going to prove everything in one jump, is he? Oh, no, sir. Not by a long shot. It'll probably be more like a thousand before we're ready to test the shoot with live personnel. Well, don't go using any men on those things until you're sure. And Hoffman... Uh, yes, sir? Let me know when Dummy Joe completes a thousand jumps. I think by that time he ought to have a medal pinned on him. Well, we got to rig up that time fuse some other way, Ed. Yeah, you're right. Dummy Joe's got a delay before the ripcord's pulled. Otherwise, he'll get all tangled in the tail surfaces of the plane. All right? Let's fix it right now. Now, this is the way I've worked it out. A load of 400 pounds released from a plane flying at 120 miles an hour will put just as much strain on the chute, if not more, as a delayed drop of 16 seconds. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, I'll take your word for it. Let's go find something for Dummy Joe to carry on his next jump. Come up with anything to figure out why those rigging lines are breaking? Yeah, I think so. This thing looks complicated, and it is, sort of. But you see, it should record the amount of strain on each individual cord. Then we'll know what's pulling too much in the drop. Hey, look at you. What's the matter? Your company got a parade? Well, can I put on my dress uniform once in a while? Sure. Sure, sure. I just haven't seen you in anything but fatigues for so long. It came as sort of a shock. Well, you and Guy and me are invited over to Julie's and Bob's tonight, so go find yourself a white shirt and a tie. She's expecting us in about half an hour. (laughs) Why didn't you bring Dummy Joe along? Well, we really should have, you know. This should actually be his celebration. (laughs) How's that? Has he performed some act beyond the call of duty? You can certainly say that. Tomorrow's going to be jump number 1,000. Yeah, yeah. More than that. More than that, too. As a matter of fact, the last hundred times he bailed out has been perfect. There's no reason he has to make this one tomorrow, except the colonel promised him a medal if he did it. I'd like to make that bail out instead of Dummy Joe tomorrow. What? You don't mean that, Ed. Why do you look so shocked? Why do you think we've been making all these experiments? We've been working on these parachutes for men to use, not for Dummy Joe. Well, sure, of course, I, I know that, but it's... Well, I guess I never really thought about you or, or Floyd or Guy or, or Bob parachuting from a plane. Julie, you confuse me. Nothing would satisfy you, but Ed had to have everyone believe in him and help him in his experiments. Now that he's got it ready for a man to try out, you're sitting there mumbling that a man shouldn't do it. I know it's silly, but I I just wish somebody I didn't know would try it. Well, it's not going to be someone you don't know, Julie. It's going to be someone you've known for almost ten years. Me. Look, Ed, I know how you feel. I've been in on a lot of this. I know just as much about that shoot as you do, and furthermore, I've had actual experience. I've jumped in shoots a lot worse than the ones you started with. I'll jump tomorrow. Hey, now, wait, wait a minute. How about me? I've chalked up just as many jumps as you. I've got a better idea than any of you. After all, it was my crash that got you started on this. Let me have the first try at the thing you thought about because of me. I think you're all crazy. There's only one way to settle this. We'll do it the way we did when we were kids. Now, here, I'll break these toothpicks. Don't watch. We'll draw straws. That's ridiculous. Stop, stop grumbling. Just draw one. Ed, you go first. Floyd. Yeah. Guy. And Bob. Thanks. Gosh, I hate to be selfish, but I sort of hope you're out. I am. I think you stacked them. Oh, well, let's see the rest of them. Oh, of all the rotten luck. Okay, Floyd. (laughs) It's Dummy Joe's shoot for you tomorrow. I'll go along in the plane with him. All right, I'll check from the ground. Julie, you and Bob come on out to the field with us tomorrow. You were in on the beginning... I want you to see our dream come true. I almost think it would be easier up there in the plane than down here. You're darned right it would be. The plane's coming in for the jump now. Cross your fingers and pray. There he goes. It's not opening. The chute's not opening. Oh, it'll open. It's got to. There it is. It's open. Oh, just as pretty as you please. And not a tree in sight for him to land in. 
and no wind to blow him anywhere but right down here at our feet. I almost didn't make it. I wouldn't miss this for anything. Colonel, I... Well, I, I, I thought you were off the base. I was. Darn near broke my neck getting back here. Wouldn't have missed Dummy Joe's jump for anything. One thousand today, isn't it? I've been keeping pretty close track of that little guy. Colonel, uh, this is a little difficult to explain. You see, you weren't around. What are you mumbling about, Hoffman? Well, I, I, I'm just trying to say that... Well, that isn't Dummy Joe, sir. Not Dummy Joe? Well, then who... Hoffman, you don't mean to say there's a real live human being in that contraption. It's Floyd Smith, Colonel. We drew straws and he won. Colonel, look how beautifully it's working. Why, it's just like a, a child in a swing. He's down. Let's go out and give him a hand. Well, how'd she work, Floyd? Oh, perfect, perfect. Not a thing wrong. You ought to order enough of these for every man, Colonel. What I ought to do is court-martial you, Hoffman. Colonel, think what it would have meant to the men like Bob who crashed if they'd had parachutes. Think what it will mean to all the men who are flying and will fly in the future. And besides, Colonel, all you said was not to let a man jump until the parachute was safe. Well, you just saw it work, sir. Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess that's what I said. Well, I'm a man of my word, and I said something else, too, so let's go. Where, Colonel? Into the hangar. You've had your glory for today. I'll give another guy a chance. I'm going to pin a medal on Dummy Joe. America is depending on her leaders in the air. If you're a young man between the ages of 19 and 26 and a half, have had two or more years of college and are otherwise qualified, you are eligible to join the ranks of America's leaders in the air. You can become an aviation cadet. The defense of our nation hangs heavily on our air strength, the finest in the world. But we cannot relax our efforts. The Air Force still needs pilots and aircraft observers. If you have the primary qualifications, visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. Ask about the Aviation Cadet Training Program. Do it now. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Bureau for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>